Oh, Lord, we come before you humbly this morning. We're here to worship you. We're here to give a joyful noise to you this morning, Lord. We're here to write our own hallelujah as we sing and as we praise your name in this place, God. I pray that you would come and you'd let your spirit fall heavy in this place, Lord, that we could tap into your, your unending flow of life and of your spirit, Lord. I pray that we would just be attuned, that we tune our radio of our soul to your heart this morning, Lord, that we might hear and we might feel you as, as we go deeper and deeper still, Lord. I pray that you would give us a full drink, a full measure of your glory this morning. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Just so stand and join us as we sing. To the King of Glory and Light. To the King of Glory and Light. All praises. All praise. To the only giver of life, our maker, our maker. The gates are open, the gates are open wide, and we worship you. Come and see what love has done. Come and see what love has done. Amazing. He bought us with his blood, and our Savior, the cross is overcome. We worship you. Let's sing it out. Shout Hosanna. We shout Hosanna. Jesus, he saves. Shout Hosanna. He rose from the grave. Come and lift him up. Hosanna. Now let the lost. Now let the lost be found. Death could not hold him down. He's risen, so let the saints cry out. We worship you. We worship you. Shout, Hosanna. Jesus, he saves. Shout, Hosanna. He rose from the grave. He says, shout, Hosanna, he rose from the grave, come and lift him up, Hosanna. Come and lift him up, Hosanna. Lift you up, God. The same power that rolled the stone away, the same power alive in us today. When King Jesus, we call upon your name, no other name. The same power that rolled the stone away, the same power. Jesus, he saves. Shout, Hosanna. He rose from the grave. Come and lift him up. Hosanna. Shout, Hosanna. Jesus, he saves. Shout, Hosanna. He rose from the grave. Come and lift him up. Hosanna. Oh, we lift him up. So come and lift him up, Hosanna. So come and lift him up, Hosanna. This God, we lift you up in this place this morning, Lord, and we cry Hosanna to our King. Lord, we surrender it all to you this morning, God, because the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's none like our King, the Lord God Almighty. When all I see is the battle, you 
you see my victory? When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain. And as I walk, and as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Come on. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, and with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet. Oh, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, and if you are for me, who can be against me? Thank you, Lord. For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet oh I sing through the night oh God the battle belongs to you yes the battle belongs to you he's an almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our shine in the shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our God an almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our God you shine in the shadows you win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God and Almighty Fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you On every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet, oh, I sing through the night, oh, God, the battle belongs to you, yes, oh, the battle belongs to you, amen, hallelujah, Lord, yes, Lord, we are gracious, Lord, we are gracious for your great victory, Lord, over death, over sin and shame, Lord. Lord, that we can surrender ourselves to you, Lord, and that you fight our battles, Lord. For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you, Lord. Our victor, our champion, our king.
what can I offer to a king for all the love you show for all your mercy over me I called your name you heard my cry out of the grave and into life my heart is yours my soul is free thank you god for saving me thank you god for saving me The rock of salvation My hope is built on nothing less Morning by morning How great is your faithfulness I called your name You heard my cry
power has no end the things you've done before in greater measure and you will do again there's no present no wall you can't break through no mountain you can't move all things are possible there's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save, all things are possible. The darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome. Already won, oh God of revival. We praise you, Lord. You rose in victory, and now you see it forever on the road. Why should my heart fear what you defeated? And I will trust in you alone. Cause there's no prison, no wall you can't break through. No mountain you can't move. All things are possible. There's no broken body you can't raise. No soul that you can't save. All Possible. The darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome, you've already won, oh God of revival, the darkest night. Remind you of your promise this morning. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my space and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Lord, we remind you of your promise this morning, Lord, that you would come and you would heal this land, God. That your fire would spark a revival, Lord. Let your water fall. Let your fire fall, God. Come and heal this land. Come and forgive our sins, God. Bring your revival, Lord. Come awake. And come awake in your people. And come awake in the city. Oh, God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. I hear the chains hit the ground. Oh, God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Awaken your people, come awake in the city, 
got last night's uh, newsletter, then you know that uh, the Lord has redirected me this morning. <clears throat> Oftentimes when he comes in this way, first off, I'm very excited when he does this, but oftentimes when he comes, like if you've read the, the, the first couple of chapters of the book of Revelation, you, you know that when he came to speak to the churches, he had some good words for them, but he also had some correction for them. And this is not unlike the nature of our God. It's an old story about a hanging judge. I'm sure I've shared it with you before. He, he was known for being absolutely ruthless to anybody who came into his court with a DUI. You come in with a DUI, you are going down. One day, his son is brought before him with a DUI. And the question was going to be, what's going to happen? What is he going to do? And the judge, well, true to his own nature, he threw the book at his son. 
gave him the maximum fine. But then after he was done, he got up, took his robe off, and went down, hugged his son, and paid the fine. This is the nature of our God. He has standards. And, and those standards don't change, but he also loves you. And I want you to keep that in mind as we continue this morning. Let's begin in Luke chapter 15, verse 22. Last week we talked a little bit about how God leads us and how God works in our lives and how he prepares us. And sometimes it is the things that we suffer that he teaches us through. I had planned on continuing that route this morning. Um, but really, just in a couple of days, he shifted all that. So forgive me if this is a little bit disjointed. What I'm going to do is I want to tap into a number of messages I've already shared with you. And I want to bring some new things. I've been sharing messages with you over the last couple of years. And these messages are important for what's coming. But what's happening is the timeline seems to be moving up quickly. And because the timeline is moving up quickly, you need to be in the loop. You need to know what's happening. You need to know what's going on. Now, you might remember back to the end of 2019, the first part of 2020, when the pandemic first started to rear its head. And the truth is, we didn't know a whole lot about what it was. All we knew is that a lot of people were expected to die. They were talking about millions dead in a couple of months. That, of course, never never happened. But God spoke to us at that time. And he gave us some direction about what he was doing. And the word that, that seemed most logical to me as I was interpreting what he said was pop quiz. He was bringing a pop quiz to us. And he was going to prepare us. And largely the word that he gave uh, to prepare us came out of the, uh, the parable of the prodigal son. And you might remember that the prodigal son, when he came to his senses and returned, the father gave him three gifts. If you'll look in Luke 15, 22, we'll find those. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. These were the three gifts. Let's pray. Lord, I, I ask you humbly today, would you help me to share your word with your people? Father, I pray that it would bring strength and not condemnation. I pray, Father, it would bring courage and not despair. Father, I pray that it would... I pray, Father, your anointing would be here and that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit's saying to the church today. Help me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And so I told you at this time, as, as these words were coming forth, that what we were seeing was largely a pop quiz. And... and I don't know a better term for it, but you understand what pop quizzes are and what they do, right? What, what they have a tendency to do is shake things up. They have a tendency to shake out the riffraff. A lot of people come to college and they're just kind of playing games, right? They're finding themselves, whatever that means. Well, when pop quizzes come, that has a tendency to shake things up a lot. And pop quizzes are never, I've never known one to be designed to be a large part of your final exam. They are simply meant to help you understand what you know versus what you think you know. You understand the difference here, right? See, I can explain things to you, but I can't understand them for you. And it's only when the rubber meets the road that we learn to understand the things that we have been taught. Now, at the time, what I shared with you, this would have been early 2020, there were going to be three phases of this pop quiz. And the first phase of this pop quiz was going to be the virus. It was going to be the sickness. And the direction I believe the Lord gave us at that time was the robe 
was what was going to be required as the tool to fight uh, this particular phase. The robe, of course, represents righteousness. It represents your authority. Remember, it's the prayer of the righteous man that is powerful and effective. To pass this first phase of the test, I said that you're going to need to take up your authority in Christ. Again, I just need to clarify things. You, you understand that we don't have the power to change anything. We can't stop the virus. We can't control the virus. But what we do have is authority over the virus, and that is way more powerful. Here's the deal. You ever seen a traffic cop out there directing traffic, and a big old bus comes up, and he just holds up his hand? You understand that man has no power to stop that bus. None. That bus will fold him up like a milk carton. What he has is authority. And he holds up his hand and the bus stops. We need to use our authority. The next phase of the shaking or, or pop quiz was going to be a shaking of finances. I believe that's what the Lord told us. And I said for that phase, we would need the ring. The ring is a symbol of your covenant with him. It's a, it's a covenant that makes up the difference in your life. When you're insufficient in your life, you can call on the covenant, and it'll take you over the top. I can't tell you the number of times in my life where I just messed everything up, and, and I knew people had a right to be mad at me and angry with me, and yet the covenant made up the difference. There was grace for me when there shouldn't have been. That is, that is the blessing at work. And I told you at the time, if you find yourself tangled up in financial issues, don't panic. Don't panic. All you need to do is begin to invoke your covenant. You may, you may have to show the ring to the enemy. You may have to look at the ring yourself. Sometimes we forget who we are. It's important to look at the ring, and it's important to show the ring to the enemy and remind him, I'm not subject to the taxes of this realm. I don't know if you know what I mean by that. This realm has many, many taxes. Sickness is a tax that is paid in this realm. I'm not subject to that tax. Now, I get a bill for it, but I'm not subject to it. Death is a tax that is available to you in this realm. I am not subject to that tax. Financial insufficiency is a tax that happens in this realm. I am not subject to that tax because of my lineage. You understand what I'm telling you? Now, maybe an example is good. We, we just celebrated the Passover, and you might remember as these plagues begin to hit Egypt, Things were getting pretty sketchy in the land of Egypt. It was dark, and there were frogs, and there were flies. And you know it was in the land of Goshen, the land of the Israelites? It was light, and there wasn't frogs, and there wasn't all this crazy. God had made a distinction between the people of the covenant and the people of the world. And God makes a distinction today between you, the people of his covenant, and the people of the world. The thing is, he'll do the same thing for you he did for them, but you may need to show the ring. Do you get what I'm saying? Sometimes you have to remind the enemy, I don't have to pay these taxes. Now, the third phase. God told us it was going to be a shaking in the church. He was going to, he was going to shake the church, and, and there would come disunity among the church, and that there would be dissension among believers. This is the picture of the older brother who wouldn't receive the younger brother when he returned. And to be clear, God had spoken to us at the time that this third phase wasn't just going to be a shaking of the church, but it was going to be a shaking of all religion. It was going to shake everything up. But you and I both know the Bible's quite clear. The shaking always begins with the house of God. That is the way God does things. And the word he gave us for this third phase was that it was going to require the sandals. This is the symbol of equipping. It's the preparation for duty. 
Ephesians chapter 6, Paul tells us to stand firm with our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. This third phase of the shaking would actually rework the gospel into many people. There would be a restoration of genuine faith. And I think we saw much of that begin to happen. And so as we saw these three phases begin to work themselves out over the last couple of years, the pandemic, it came in waves. The first, the first phase actually came in waves. There was an initial virus, and then there was a second wave of the virus, and then a third wave of the virus, and today this has largely reached its end, although not quite everybody's on board with that yet. You still see people who are afraid. You still see people. I'm not picking on anybody, but, you know, what, one of my favorites is a guy riding a motorcycle wearing a mask and no helmet. Okay, not picking. We also, we saw the financial markets hit. This happened in March of 2020, and it was, it was impressive, to say the least. It hit, it hit every single asset. Nothing. Was, there was no place to hide. It hit everything. And after that, we began to see the dissension in churches. We began to see brothers, men and women, who claim the name, arguing with each other, wounding each other, over silly issues, silly issues, arguing about masks and vaccinations, degrading each other, putting each other down. This pop quiz, when it came, it took a toll on the church. But as it turned out, a lot of the church was just plain church. They were just plain. They said they believed, but they didn't really believe. You understand the difference. I can say I understand math, but when I start working out the problem, then we find out if I understand math. Turned out, it wasn't just people playing church, but it turned out a number of churches were playing church too. Some of those churches didn't make it. Some of them, some of them folded up. Now, the people in the churches didn't, didn't they aren't lost. They got re-added to other churches. But you begin to see God shaking. And I want you to understand something this morning. I'm not being harsh. I'm not being uh, condemning. I'm not being judging. I'm simply pointing out truth. There's a lot of people talking a pretty big game. Ain't no weapon formed against me going to prosper. Nothing's coming near me. But when the rubber met the road, it turned out all that talk. Well, it was just that. It was talk. There was no faith mixed with it. And as people began to get sick, and as people began to suffer financially, and as people found their brothers condemning them because they weren't in line with the way other people thought they should be, their faith got damaged. And so we saw these three phases. And something I have shared with you, one of the gifts in my life has a prophetic nature to it. The nature of real prophecy, the real deal, the genuine article, almost always, almost without exception, the real deal is almost always fulfilled over and then over again in a greater way and then over again in yet a greater way, a greater fulfilling each time. You, you see this with... John the Baptist, God promises that uh, in Malachi that Elijah will come before the Lord comes. Well, and then Jesus says, if you can hear it, it was John the Baptist who was supposed to come before him. But we also know, reading the end of the book, that that promise is going to be fulfilled in a greater way when Elijah himself comes and he will stand at the wall. And he will be one of the two witnesses. So there's an initial fulfilling which is real and accurate. But there's a much greater fulfilling that happens at a later time. Does this make some sense to you? You're familiar with these types of things? Here's what the Lord has shown me. Just as 
there are near and far prophecies, uh, partial fulfillments and then greater fulfillments later this, this issue, this, this shaking is going to be fulfilled in greater ways. The pandemic, we saw it initially fulfilled. And then we saw it fulfilled in a greater way, right? The second wave came and it was way greater than the first. And then another wave came, an Omicron wave. It touched almost everybody. There was almost nobody that wasn't in some way affected by it. It hit. didn't matter if you were vaccinated or unvaccinated. It just didn't matter. It caught everybody, most everybody. So we've already seen this begin to happen, this word that it is going to happen and it's going to happen again in a greater fulfillment and it'll happen again later in a greater fulfillment. Here's what I need to tell you today. You've watched the phase of the pandemic work its way out. The next phase of that second working out is going to be a financial working out. The first phase financially was largely worked out in March of 2020. And as I told you, it hit every single asset. There was no place to hide. There is a greater and deeper working out of this financial phase that is on the horizon. I can't see when it is. I can't tell you when it is. What I can tell you is it will be worse than the first one. The original working out was largely isolated. In other words, it didn't hit everybody. This next outworking is going to be more like the Omicron phase. It will largely hit almost everybody. Again, I don't mean to be too dramatic, but I do need you to be in the loop. I would not I would not be a good pastor if I wasn't telling you what the Lord was showing me. I believe that and I shared this with you last year. The Lord spoke to us and he said you need to get out of debt. I believe then, and I believe still today, he was preparing us for the things that are coming. He's preparing his church for the things that lie ahead. Here's the thing, guys, about faith. Faith was made for moments just like this. That's what faith was made for. It wasn't made for your comfort. I think the church has forgotten that. We use our faith to get another weekend that, you know, Bali, or, or we, we use our faith for a Great parking place at the grocery store. Well, I'm not mad at you. I'm just saying your faith was designed for this, what, what, what lies ahead. You need to hear me now. The tool he gave us for this last round was the ring. That was the tool for the financial issue that was coming. It will again be the tool required for the hour. I need to remind you, I felt very strong that the Lord was saying that I need to remind you. It's a pop quiz again, just like it was last time. It isn't the final. It isn't, it isn't the big one. It's a pop quiz. Pop quizzes are designed to reveal weakness so correction can be made before the final comes. But I'm telling you, before it happens, that this pop quiz is on the horizon. And I want you to understand it as a grace being shown to you. You need to understand it that way. I hated pop quizzes in college. I hated them because they embarrassed me. Because the truth is I didn't know the material. That was the truth. And it made me angry. But I shouldn't have been angry at the teacher. He was giving me a grace. He was helping me understand you don't know the material. Friends, we need to know the material. Let's turn to Luke chapter 16, verse 10. I'm not sharing with you anything you don't already know. You know all this. Jesus says this, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth. Now listen, who will trust you with true riches? 
And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Can you see that Jesus makes a distinction between worldly wealth and true riches? He doesn't consider worldly wealth true riches. You ever pick up a penny when you see it on the ground? I got to tell you, most of the time people won't even pick up dimes anymore. They just sit there at the grocery store. When I was a kid, I always picked up the pennies. And as an adult, I continued to pick up pennies. I had a jar in the dresser. I just throw the pennies in there all the time. The idea for me was I wanted to remember that even the littlest of things is of value. And so I picked up the pennies. Truth is, they weren't worth much. It's a thin analogy, so forgive me, but this world, in many ways, is like God's penny jar, right? The gold and the silver, it's where he keeps his gold and silver. They're pennies. I suppose it's worth taking it to the bank, but not really. This is where he keeps his silver and gold. And, and people are free to use his pennies, his silver and his gold. You're free to use it. But the pennies will always remain in the jar. You can't take the pennies with you. When you depart the jar, the pennies stay. We, you and I, we tend to think of silver and gold as things of great value. What I'm trying to help paint a picture of for you today is that God does not. Silver and gold is not of great value. It's pennies. What God considers of great value is the souls of men and women. That's what he considers valuable. He's like a man who finds a great treasure in a field. And he sells everything he has to buy the field. He's like the merchant who finds a pearl of great price and then sells everything he has to purchase it. I hope you can understand, guys, he is really not concerned with silver and gold. What he's interested in is you. You are the pearl of great price. You're the treasure that's hidden in the field, and he, he paid the ultimate price to acquire you. He paid the ultimate price. If I can use the term, this is what God spends his money on. It's what's important to him. It's what he considers real riches. So the question with this upcoming pop quiz, and it is upcoming, have you been trustworthy with the little bits of worldly riches he's entrusted you with? Can I, can I present it this way? I, I do this a lot. Some people are living within their means. Some people are living within their money. Aren't those the same? No, they're not the same at all. See, if I were to live in my means, I can take on massive amounts of debt. I could take on massive amounts of debt. I get little offers all the time, credit card companies. We'd like to extend more credit to you. You know why? Because I've been faithful with the first credit they extended. But see, I don't live within my means. I live within my money. That's a very different thing. See, the problem the prodigal son had was he took what he had and he squandered it. He lost it all. Do you remember when he came home? Was the father mad or not mad? He wasn't mad. You need to understand that. The father was not mad. Because the truth is, it isn't real riches. Not really. See, what the father wanted to give the son was the ring and the robe and the sandals. But if you're going to get the ring and the robe and the sandals, you're going to have to return to the father. You have to come back to get those. Just like the prodigal son, guys, you are going to have to come to your senses. Prodigal son realized, I can't keep living like this. This is not going anywhere good. You're going to have to come to that point. 
And then you're going to have to repent. Repent doesn't mean you're sorry. It means you change your mind about the way you're doing things. And you then begin to do them differently. It's a thought change and it's an action change. Guys, what I need to tell you today, it's it's time. It's time for debt to stop running your life. I promise you, I promise you, the borrower will most assuredly become the servant to the lender. It is coming. That passage is going to be fulfilled in its fullness. Some are still trusting on the government to make ends meet. You know, when we saw the first, the first financial wave come, the government stepped in and made everything okay. You guys have trouble, we're going to hook you up with some extra cash. This next round of the pop quiz is going to teach you the only secure place to run is the Father. It's time to come to your senses. It's time to return home to the Father and let Him give you the robe and the ring and the sandals. I know this is heavy. I don't mean it to be heavy, but you need to hear because it's coming and you need to be ready. You understand, we didn't get, there was no warning when the pandemic came. It just happened. We, we, we scurried trying to get ready and trying to do things. It came on us in a moment. That is not at all the case with this financial shoe that is about to drop. This is not coming on us in a moment. This has been obvious for years. Anybody who's been paying any attention has said, we can't keep living like this. People all the time say, if I ran my house like the government ran their house, I'd... I'd I'd be in the poorhouse. So what happens is people start to see these things coming. You know, they see them coming. They say, I don't know what to do. What do I do? What can I do? Where, what, do what should I buy? Where should I put my money? Now, can, I, can I just be honest with you? Step one, get out of debt. Step one, get out of debt. Do you know... If you just pay off a credit card that has a 15% interest rate on it, you just got a 15% return on your money. What bank in the world will give you that? None. You get out of debt. We'll talk about the other things. I want you to understand something, friends. God's interest does not lie in silver and gold. It doesn't lie in money. That's not where his interest lies. You and I, we are part of a kingdom. We have been adopted as sons, daughters. And like any kingdom, this particular kingdom we're in has resources. Lots of different resources. And the subjects of this kingdom, you and me, we fight battles, we wage wars over those resources. Those resources are the souls of men and women. We fight for them, and we, we share the gospel, and we pray for them, and we continue to push for them because that's what's of real value. We want to not only keep the resources we have, but we want to gain new resources as well. I hope you know by now, friends, we are not fighting for silver and gold. It's pennies in a penny jar. Today, this very hour, God's kingdom and the kingdom of darkness are clashing epically over resources. They're looking for the souls of men and women. This is the focus that your, bat your battle focus. This is what you need to be fighting for. Here's the problem. As this financial thing begins to unfold, I fear it's going to hamstring a number of God's warriors. Their focus will have to shift off the battle at hand, and it'll have to shift to self-preservation. You understand what I'm telling you? 
Do you understand? That's a trap that's being set for you and not by God. He's not setting a trap. Your enemy is setting a trap for you. And what does the scripture say? Proverbs 117, how futile it is to spread the net where any bird can see it. It's futile to set a trap if you're paying attention. I'm not going to step in that. I'm telling you, you're watching the trap being set right now. Forgive me, please, if this all seems too harsh. I, do, I really don't mean it to be harsh. But I also need you to hear the gravity of what's happening. I don't want you to suffer unnecessarily. I read an article this week out of Northwestern Mutual. They got a planning and progress group. They did a, a recent study of U.S. adults aged 18 and over those who actually are carrying debt. Some don't. Some have just refused to. Of those, though, 18 and over who are carrying debt, the average household debt was $23,325. And that did not include mortgages. So what that is is largely credit card debt, car debt, boat debt, third house debt, Here's why this is a problem. And again, I'm not trying to scare you. I need you to pay attention. See, what happens is when money changes, and money's about to change. I've told you this now for at least a year. Money's about to change. And when it does, those who are tangled in the world system of debt will be relegated to change to the new money with them. Now, I'm not talking about the mark of the beast. You need to say that. Rod's not talking about the mark of the beast. What I'm talking about is you getting tangled up in a revaluation of money that is not going to be in your favor, right? You can pay off debt today with cheap dollars, right? The do we all know the dollars are worthless. Use those cheap dollars to pay off your debt instead of waiting until money gets revalued and using expensive dollars to pay it off. See, what's going to happen when the revaluation happens? People are going to suffer financially because of this. It's easy to solve the problem now. I can't tell you when this next shoe is going to drop, but I can tell you it's close. God would not be speaking to me like this. I mean, he tells me things, but I don't often share them. He's made it clear it's time to share it. You need to be in the loop. Now, here's the direction the Lord has given me today. I need, I need to give you some understanding before I can give it to you. So I want to look at Isaiah 28, verse 16. I want you to understand the what and the why so I can explain the how. So this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Isaiah 28, 16. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation the one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Hell will sweep away your refuge. The lie and the water will overflow your hiding places. Your covenant with death will be annulled. And your agreement with the realm of the dead will not stand. And I'm just going to stop right there. This is a prophetic passage about the end of the age. And what happens... Uh, it, it, if you know the, the, the process, see, Israel is going to enter into a covenant with death at the end of the age. That will mark the beginning of the final seven. And God, it says, is going to cancel. He's going to annul the covenant of death. And and first time I read that, I thought, how can God annul a covenant somebody else made? I mean, he's God. I, I get it. But, but there's rules to all these things. You can't just willy-nilly do stuff. God says he's going to annul it. The answer of why God can do that is found in Numbers verse 30. Um, Numbers chapter 30, verse 1. If you were here Wednesday night, this word came forth at the very end. Numbers chapter 30, verse 1. And Moses said to the heads of the tribes of Israel, This is what the Lord commands. 
When a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. When a young woman, still living in her father's household, and makes a vow to the Lord or obligates herself by a pledge, and her father hears about her vow or pledge, but says nothing to her, and all of her vows and every pledge by which she obligated herself will stand. But if her father forbids her when he hears about it, none of her vows or pledges by which she obligated herself will stand. The Lord will release her because her father forbade her. Here's the rule. The papa in the house has the right to say no. I know she did that. I know she said that. I know she entered into a covenant. No. This is what God did. Israel enters into a covenant with death and God annuls it. No, I'm the papa in the house. It's not going to happen. Child enters foolishly into these things. And the papa has the right to annul it. So here's the direction for us today. Here's what the Lord has shown me and what I want to do. Many of you have entered into covenants with debt. You sign paperwork. Yep, I'll pay that back. 20% interest, no problem. That seems good to me. And, and you're going to add more later? Fine. You've entered into covenants with debt. Today is the papa in the house. I'm going to cancel those debts. I'm going to take authority. According to God's word, I'm going to nullify those covenants. Okay, now listen to me. If you've been sleeping up to now, please wake up and listen to me. That does not mean you can stop paying your bills. Don't say, well, Rod said we could, and so I didn't pay anymore. <laughs> no. I've already told you, things happen first in the spirit, and then they roll into the natural. We are going to do a spiritual action today that will, in fact, roll into the natural. And when your debt is canceled, when God brings you the cash to pay it off, when it happens, then you can stop paying. Now, you need to understand about how spiritual actions work. Elisha was a man who loved spiritual actions. She throws a stick in the water and an axe head floats. There are no magical properties wood has to make iron float. It was an action that he did, and he expected a reaction. He throws flour in the poison pot, and it's safe. Flour does not make poison go away. That's not a, a property of flour. It was a spiritual action, a prophetic action. I say this today because if you don't believe that I have the authority to cancel this, the truth is I don't. You have to respond by faith. If you don't believe that this is possible, then for you, friend, it's not. I'm not being hard. I'm just telling you, you must mix the action with faith or it will produce nothing in you. But if you do believe, if you believe that there is authority according to God's word to cancel debt, then it will happen today. You must receive this by faith. Now, Actions are always accompanied together with faith. I believe and then I act. So if you read last night's email, I asked you to bring a dollar today. I don't know how many of you actually read it. So some of you may not have a dollar. That's okay. If you need to borrow a dollar, borrow a dollar. For heaven's sake, pay it back. <laughs> you have faith today, I want you to stand up and receive this. You have to take a stand. You're going to have to stand. If you don't have faith, you can just stay seated. It's okay. Nobody's going to think less of you. I'm not going to think less of you. I want you to mix what's about to happen with faith. Father, today, in Jesus' name, as the Papa in this house, Father, I nullify the covenants 
your people have struck with debt. I ask in Jesus' name that you would free them from the snare of their debt. Father, I ask that you would make it so there is no longer any financial tie to this broken system of the world. Father, I speak freedom over them in Jesus' name, and I say these covenants with debt will not stand. In Jesus' name. You can just stay standing for a minute. Now, I purposely didn't do the tithes and offerings this morning. I just jumped right into this because I wanted to pick this up at the end. The reason I asked you to bring a dollar today, in Mark chapter 12, verse 17, Jesus said this. He says, Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what belongs to God's. That dollar I asked you to bring today is a simple representation of what belongs to Caesar. That's all it is. And today I'm gonna I got a little plastic bucket. I'm gonna set it up over there in the corner. I just want you to give back to Caesar that one dollar. You just give it back to him. I want you in your life to make a distinction between what belongs to God and what belongs to Caesar. And 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 it doesn't have to be a dollar. It can be a dime or a nickel or it can be it can be a hundred dollars. It doesn't matter. It's a symbolic action that you're making. You're throwing the stick in the water. You're putting the flower in the pot. You are making a decisive action to give back to Caesar what belongs to him and separating yourself from his system. And at the very same time, at the very same time, there's a bucket right next to it. That is to give to God what belongs to God. Now, again, I'm not fishing... For money, I just want you to understand, make the distinction between what belongs to Caesar and give that to him, and what belongs to God and give that to him. It is the throwing of the dollar in the plastic bucket that makes this. It seals this. And again, it doesn't matter what denomination, you're, you're making a conscious decision, I'm separating from the world system, and debt is the way of the world system. It is not the way of the kingdom. So Father, now I seal up these things in your people. Father, I bless your people today in Jesus' name. Father, I say the debt is far from them. They will, they will borrow from none going forward, but they will lend and give to many. They are a people of all sufficiency in all things. I bless them in this manner, Father, now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to throw the plastic bucket up over here in the corner. And you can just toss the worthless dollars in. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave the bread to his disciples. And he said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. And when the supper was ended, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, which shall be shed for you, so that your sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. After the next phase of the financial issue comes, another phase will follow that, which will be a greater shaking in the church. There will be greater dissension in the church. There will be greater troubles in the church and again these are all part of what God is doing in the world right it's time for us to grow up it's time for us not to be children any longer now in regards to the plastic bucket I don't have any real clear insight but I will say this the question that the the teachers of the law had asked Jesus they said is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not Jesus said, give to Caesar what's his and give to God what's his. That money is not going to be added to our treasury. It'll be 
return back to one of the places that receives government aid and help, and again, it'll act more like a tax. All right, I just want you to know it's not, it's not going to end up in our treasury because that would miss the whole point of it. So with that, Father, I bless your people today. Thankful for them, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your people. Father, I pray that you would help us, Father, to see what is real value. Help us, Father, to lay hold of the things for which Christ has laid hold of us. I bless your people now in Jesus' name, and I send them in your peace. Amen. All right, if I caused you trouble, which quite likely I might have, I'll be up here. Otherwise, have a great week.